So next we're going to have a, a video. Um, I at least made Dave Otis give us a video to talk about some things since he's off enjoying his planned vacation in Scandinavia. And I'm going to say some nice things about him, but I really should, since he's not here, just make up stuff. And <laughs> we can go from there. We should have told him, take some time out. You can do a live feed. You know, he could have been in some nice background fjord. There could have been reindeer, God, even wolves and brown bears or little lemmings running along the ground. But he's like, nah, nah, I'm not going to do that. It was hard enough to get him. He, he, his, his comment was, as I said, God, can you get me these videos, you know, several weeks ago? And he's like, I've never done any of this. And I'm like, I think I created work for myself. But he pulled it off. David earned all his degrees from CSU. His first, his bachelor's was in mathematics. And then he has MS and PhDs in statistics. He then did a postdoc with David at Utah State University. I never asked David, but I'll have to ask, well, they're both David. I never asked David Anderson, but I'll have to ask Otis if uh, David at all picked up on the fact that he did have degrees from CSU since David went here for his undergraduate, or if it was the research he had worked on for his PhD. He has a long association, work, although his degrees are in math and statistics, in the wildlife professional. After his, his postdoc, he spent a number of years at the Denver Wildlife Research Center, where I first met him when we, we came on a trip during my master's to look at some funding, and Dave had some funding. Um, it ended up being taking a big head of a sunflower seed in North Dakota over the summer and mimicking blackbird damage. I was gonna be out there with a spoon. And, they, and, he, and he's like, and they come in from the edge, and I'm going, neat. <laughs> and we didn't have the internet, but I knew North Dakota was hot. You're in a sunflower field, bugs. I chose the project in New Mexico, which was hotter than hell, but doing small mammal work. But it was neat talking with, with David. Um, after his postdoc, he spent, uh, uh, well, I said Denver Wildlife Re Research Center. It was with the Fish and Wildlife Service then. It transitioned to USDA, and he then became the chief of its bird uh, research section. And that's actually the time I, I met him. He was, he was the head of the bird section at that point. He then later transitioned to the South Carolina Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Unit at Clemson and was also on their faculty. He remained there for about 10 years before becoming the leader of the Iowa Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Unit at Iowa State University. And he retired in 2011. Upon his retirement, he came back to Fort Collins and the department's been fortunate to have him as an affiliate faculty where he, served on, he serves on graduate student committees. He's got some research projects, and he, and he uh, interacts quite a bit. His research emphases have included development and evaluation of quantitative tech, techniques in applied ecology, and in particular, morning dove population dynamics and management. He's also spent a fair amount of time evaluating the effects of environmental stressors on wildlife population dynamics. His seminal work, which was alluded to by Ken Burnham, fondly referred to as Otis et al., 1978, was critical to future advancements in making inference from capture-recapture data. A similar sort of monograph, uh, Pollock et al., followed on, on open, uh, not, not only open models, but uh, still using uh, open models and closed models together. So it was, it was some great work, and I sadly had to understand it somewhat forwards and backwards in trying to simulate models from uh, 
his work. The video that's coming up, David will talk about closed capture, recapture modeling. Can you start that video? Thanks, Ken. I really appreciate the opportunity to say a few words about David, a mentor and a good friend. So I'm a firm believer in a couple of old adages. The first one is, is that timing is everything. And the second is, I'd rather be lucky than good. And boy, was I lucky. So I was finishing up my dissertation here at CSU with Dave Bowden, and we had recently discovered Sieber's book, uh, 73 or 74, and we were going through it uh, together from front to back. And it turned out that uh, th th there was also a lot going on in uh, the little world of capture recapture. Pollock uh, was finishing up his dissertation on capture recapture. Anderson and Burnham were just getting warmed up. Uh, Cormac was, uh, I think, dabbling with capture recapture over in Scotland. And uh, there was this guy named White who was on his way to uh, Logan. Uh, and was known to be quite the Fortran programmer, among other things. So Ken Burnham would come over to the statistics uh, building uh, periodically and for seminar, and neither one of us can remember how we struck up a conversation, but uh, at some point we did. Uh, and eventually uh, uh, Ken got a hold of me and uh, uh, wondered if I'd like to come over and learn about a potential position over at Utah State. So I said yes, of course, and uh, went over to Ken's office a bit later, and uh, we had a nice conversation. He described uh, what the project was about, essentially uh, improving analysis of capture recapture data and that this was going to be a, a postdoc position. I had to ask him what that was. But uh, things uh, progressed uh, eventually and uh, I was uh, very enthusiastic about uh, what I'd heard and so eventually it was time to go over the hill to Logan to uh, meet David Anderson. And uh, the first thing I remember is that he, uh, he he came over to pick me up for dinner, and he had just uh, been up in a, a helicopter that afternoon, and he was uh, collaborating with some engineers over in the engineering department at USU, and they were investigating the possibility of uh, using thermal imagery to identify individual animals. And he was very excited about this project uh, and was uh, gave me quite a lecture on, lecture on physics, which uh, I didn't understand. But again, he was uh, just so, um, you could tell that he was pretty pumped up about the, the potential of this tool. Uh, so again, uh, uh, we hadn't talked about capture recapture. So he brought me up to date on what they were doing with band reporting data or, or band recovery data. Uh, and they were working with Cavell Brownie and Doug, Doug Robson. And uh, they were doing pretty much the same thing, same flavor of what we were uh, thinking about doing for capture recapture they were going to do for 
banding data. Um, and so finally we got around to uh, capture recapture. And uh, again, we had a, a nice conversation and eventually, I guess I'd, uh, he checked me out and I, we thought this was gonna work. And, uh, you know, after we parted ways and I, I came back here to Fort Collins, I, I realized, I, I mean, I had never, be, uh, never met anyone like him. So uh, full of energy and ideas and uh, confidence that this was going to be a really wonderful uh, a project that was really going to uh, push the uh, state of art of state of the art art for uh, capture recapture data, and uh, uh, it was uh, it was clear to me that uh, this was going to be quite the ride, and I because I'd never, as I said, met someone who uh, sort of carried himself like that, and. Uh, he was going to be a real force of nature. So up we went uh, to the most beautiful college in Utah. And that's what it looks like now. But uh, when we were there, it looked like this. So this is what it looked like when we were there. Um, well, maybe not quite this far back, but uh, it was 45 years ago. And back then, um, there wasn't uh, much acknowledgement about testing assumptions of these various uh, capture-recapture estimators. There was some focus on population closure but not much uh, focus on testing of assumptions or comparisons among the available. Um, you know, there were a couple of handfuls of closed population estimators, uh, Lincoln and Bailey and Chapman and hypergeometrics and Schnabels and Derricks and whatnot. And pretty much it, practitioners were going to pick the one they liked. So, uh, so an underlying, uh, underlying theme of our work was that it was necessary to give explicit attention to assumptions about the several factors or some of the factors uh, that can affect the estimators. And this was going to re require some kind of a unified approach to the estimation of abundance. So we started off by uh, setting up a structured set of eight models, all possible combinations of three different factors that might uh, affect capture probabilities. And we built on some of the work that uh, Ken and Pollock had had done. Uh, so the three were temporal. It was ter temporal variation, maybe things like changes in weather and uh, effort. Uh, and then a couple of um, ones that are a little more biological, namely heter heterogeneity in capture probabilities among animal in individuals uh, and trap response of uh, individuals. Uh, trap shy uh, and trap happy. Uh, and, and I also remember one thing I remember, uh, just as kind of an aside, I guess. I, you know, so there's only five five estimators up in that table, as you can see. And we tried hard to get uh, a, an estimator for TB. Uh, all we needed was a, another uh, degree of freedom to, uh, uh, to, to to get something done. 
And so we tried to condition on setting a few of them equal and uh, in, in different patterns. But anyway, in the in the end, we, we just couldn't we couldn't make it perform adequately. So our next move was to assess the performance of the five estimators with respect to bias and precision and uh, robustness. And to do this, we uh, we used simulation experiments. And again, at the time. The simulation uh, uh, tools had really not been used in this context, or at least our little world. But thanks for Gary, uh, thanks to Gary and his magic, and despite the lousy mainframes at Utah State, uh, we managed to do a lot of simulations, and it was really fun. Um, I know most of you uh, would agree that it, uh, you can really get hooked on simulations, uh, go on and go down a lot of rabbit holes. But we had several objectives and points that we wanted to make based on the results, things like and demonstrating uh, that, uh, you know, if, if if you don't test the assumptions and account for any variation of capture probabilities, um, things could go uh, sideways in several different ways. Um, and assess the overall performance of different of the different estimators, relatively speaking, et cetera, et cetera. But I think equally important was we could we also used them the results to make a, a fair number of uh, recommendations about uh, study design, things like uh, demonstrating how precision could be affected by capture probabilities and the number of trapping days, and so then you could you could uh, use that to inform just how much trapping you needed to do or how many days you had to do it, etc., etc., etc. Et cetera, et cetera. Then it was wise to, to do as much as possible to allocate the same effort in traps to so as to decrease uh, the temporal factor uh, in and uh, the temporal factor effect that was going to be and turn out to be important in model selection. So the final big step was to find a rigorous way to let the data choose the best alternative for estimation for any given data set. So we ginned up uh, a handful of, a couple of handfuls of tests uh, of some were hypotheses of uh, comparing two nested models. Uh, goodness of fit tests, that sort of stuff, um, and use these to uh, construct a model selection algorithm. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with the details, and it didn't work very well, but I do think it was useful in getting people uh, thinking harder about the concept of letting the data choose. And of course, who could have imagined that a better approach, a much better approach, would come along and change everything? So about a year after uh, the monograph was published, uh, we were receiving some feedback that the monograph had a lot of good stuff in it, but uh, it was a little, for most people, it was a little um, heavy on the statistics and uh, a little light on application. And so David decided, and make no mistake, uh, that David was the leader of the band, uh, that we should do an encore workbook 
that would be more accessible to pr practitioners uh, and to begin to uh, infuse some of the concept that we were advocating for into the into mainstream thinking. So he had the playbook figured out. Uh, do a workbook that had lots of uh, 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 examples that, that you could walk people through, actually, in a lot of uh, basic statistical concepts. Um, and uh, you even uh, exercises and questions for people who might want to use it uh, for teaching. Uh, make the program more accessible uh, to people, to practitioners. Uh, all you had to do was uh, send Gary a, a letter and uh, he'd uh, send back a five inch floppy disk. Uh, and and uh, workshops. We did a few workshops. He was so good at planning and executing and communicating and just really pushing hard uh, to make progress. So you might have noticed that uh, the last three slides, pre previous last three slides, were, were all taken from the workbook. And it turns out that David could, could be a little quirky. Um, and he had a friend that, uh, that did illustrations for publications. So he thought it would be kind of cool or fun or different to uh, spruce up the uh, workbook and lighten the mood a little bit, and so we, uh, so we uh, uh, collaborated with her uh, to spread these throughout the uh, workbook. So a couple of years later, the workbook won the TWS Publication Award for monographs. And I am betting that in the long history of TWS Publication Awards that neither Bugs Bunny or Mickey Mouse or Minnie Mouse or Rocket J Squirrel have ever appeared anywhere again. Just another genius move by David. So David loved practical jokes. And so I'm going to tell you one uh, with Gary's permission. So uh, sometime in the 80s, uh, David and I were roommates at a North American conference somewhere. And we'd ask Gary to come up and shoot the breeze and have a beer or something. Uh, and so we had a little time on our hands. Uh, and we decided that we really needed to prank him. So he'd been going on and on about this new desktop computer that he had uh, uh, recently ordered, but not yet received, uh, and that this was state-of-the-art, tons of memory, lots of chips, uh, uh, it, it just really any, every, anything and everything you want. So I don't remember how we decided on this particular flaw. Uh, but we decided to have David tell him that coincidentally, uh, he had read in some technical publication 
that the Q key in this on the keyboard did not work. And they were trying to sort this, sort through this to, to try to figure out uh, the, the, the patch that needed to square things away, but that it could be worse. Uh, they, they weren't quite sure. I mean, it was possible, apparently, that it, they actually might have to recall the whole box. Well, he went down hard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so um, we commiserated with him and, uh, you know, what a bummer and that's just not right and, you know, what the hell, uh, that's just, that's just a terrible uh, uh, turn of events. And so David, who was quite, quite good at this, uh, it was, wasn't done with him. Uh, and at some point, uh, I had to excuse myself, and I went and hid in the bathroom because I was going to lose it, and I didn't want to screw up the whole play. So I stayed in there until uh, uh, David let him off the hook. I don't remember how long that was, but anyway, uh, uh, you know, Gary obviously exited pretty quickly to see uh, see what was going on here, and uh, uh, and I could get up, and I got out of the bathroom. But he was a good sport out of, about it, and um, uh, you know, we let bygones be bygones. I think. So as we all know, uh, David loved a robust discussion about it, practically any topic that was relevant to theories or analyses or philosophies uh, and about how it, that affects how we conduct our science. So one of my favorite discussions with him began, began in 1999 when uh, David invited me to help with a AIC workshop in Zurich. And so about the last uh, hour of the last day of the workshop, someone asked a question about, well, what about experiments? Uh, is AIC relevant to the, the traditional uh, experimental design analysis? And we sort of ducked and weaved and uh, didn't uh, didn't really come to any conclusions, and it sort of just uh, uh, faded away. So later on that uh, evening, uh, we went to a nice dinner at one of the attendees' house, and uh, and then we hopped on the trolley and uh, to go back to our hotel. And uh, fairly quickly, of course. Uh, uh, David asked me, so what, what do you think about this experiment question that we were talking about? And I said, uh, you know, David, I got to tell you that I don't need the AIC uh, machinery. I, I know what the model is, replication, randomization, all that sort of stuff, and that there's nothing inherently bad about uh, uh, ANOVA uh, analyses as long as you uh, uh, derive the important uh, uh, results, uh, effects, and not uh, hypothesis tests. And so we were off and running. And uh, at some point, I, I, I really don't know how long it was, uh, we realized that uh, we were literally at the end of the line and that we were the only two people on the uh, 
trolley. And I don't, we obviously came, uh, came back around somehow and got back home safely. And that was kind of the end of that, didn't come up again. So 13 years later, after I came back to Fort Collins and started hanging out at CSU and going to lunches and whatnot, it was not within a few weeks, I think. He asked me, so, so what do you think about this experiment thing? And I said, well, uh, you know, you know uh, kind of how I think about this. And he said, well, what about uh, interactions? And I said, well, you know, I'm really pretty uh, hardcore. I think if uh, I, a priori you do this experiment and uh, uh, you put interactions in there, that it's no fair to take it back out if it's not quote unquote experiment, I mean, uh, significant. But uh, I would agree that it's, uh, it's a bit of a little bit of a st uh, sticky wicket. And he looked at me and said, I win. <laughs> so I was so fortunate you know, when, uh, to have spent the first several years of my professional career learning from him. Time means everything. And then to be fortunate to have spent many years continuing to learn from him uh, after I retired. And I got lucky again. <laughs>